R&B diva Elise Simmons is up next. Let's talk. <laughs> What's up, everybody out there? How you doing? Thank you guys so much for tuning in over here to Pippi's Point of View, and I'm yours truly, Pippi. All right, let's get right into it. We're talking about R&B diva Elise Simmons. You want to stick around for the next video because I will be discussing R&B diva Karen Wheeler. That's right, that Karen Wheeler of Soul to Soul. Keep on moving back to life. But R&B diva Elise Simmons is up right now. Well, let's dive right into it. And listen, let me tell you something. I mean, this here, you know, I might step on a lot of toes with this one. I just, I'm just, it's just what it is. You know, I just got to let you know that every now and then, as I say, you know, over here, I, I, I talk about my R&B divas, but every now and then I might have to dish out the dirt on who dropped kick who in these entertainment streets. You understand what I'm saying? You know, it's just my opinion. It's my opinion. <laughs> It's just me. It's just my point of view. Whoa, but let's get right into it. How did I discover Elise Simmons? I discovered her watching television. Her video, one of her videos, um, was kind of a major, you got major airplay, you know, on the uh, radio stations. Uh, and the single was I Want It. And I remember just really and truly liking this song. And it had Cockroach from the Cosby Show in it. And I remember telling everybody, I was like, Cockroach is in a music video, <laughs> you know. And so I liked the song. It was a great up-tempo song. And then she released, I think, her first single, a single called I Want to Be Your Lover. I like that as well. The um, she was just one of my favorite uh, uh, divas back then. And so then it looked like she kind of just fizzled out. I didn't hear anything else about her until I purchased Dawn Robinson. That's right, of In Vogue. She released a solo album. And yes, I purchased Dawn Robinson's solo album. And when I'm looking at the credits, I'm like, Elise Simmons, I know that name from somewhere. And of course, it's her. She co-wrote a song on the album called Set It Off. Now, here's where we're about to go. She's definitely an R&B diva who is a singer-songwriter. And for that reason alone, she goes up a tier because you know how I feel about my R&B divas who, you know, write and produce. So she's definitely up there. So I'm going to have to check her out. Now, her the songs she's written for other artists. I'm going to uh, take some time out to see, you know, what she's about in that area as well. Okay, now let's get focused on what the toes I'm probably about to step on, or my point of view, rather. First time hearing the album. And when I heard the first song on the album, you know, I was like, okay, because the first song is I Want to Be Your Lover. I hadn't heard it in a while. And so I decided to give it a play, you know, just go back down memory lane. You know, I was like, oh, man, I remember this song. So I was feeling really good about it, you know. And then the second song, I Want It, uh, you know, started to play. And that's when I'm starting to connect some dots. And the first dot I'm connecting, I'm like, Shawnice Wilson, Tracy Spencer. You know, she obviously falls in that category of R&B divas back in the day. But to me, Elise Simmons just seemed like she was more mature. So I don't know how old Elise Simmons was when she released this album. But she had a mature vibe to me, you know. But listening to the album, 
I'm definitely getting more of a Tracy Spencer than a Shanice Wilson, you know, vocally. That's what I'm getting from her. She seems like she's more of a Tracy Spencer type style. So I was like, oh, okay, you know, I'm I'm digging it. I'm liking it, you know. And then I get to the third song on the album, a song called Love You Better. And then I was saying to myself, I was like, I like the feel of this song, I Love You Better. I do. The, the, the feel I was getting was like it could appear on Beat Street, <laughs> Breaking, right? It could appear on one of these movies or, you know, Crush Groove, but more probably Beat Street and, and uh, Breaking and Breaking 2. I know what you say. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm no slouch over here. I keep trying to tell y'all, like, I like my movie soundtracks, like back in the day. And I'm going to talk about these because there are some RB divas that appeared on these songs, on these soundtracks. I was like, what? So I was like, this song could have easily been on one of these soundtracks. Like, I really like the feel of the song, you know, definitely soundtrack material uh, as far as the song uh, Love You Better. So I was like, okay, I'm digging it. But then when we get to the fourth song, the fourth song, this is when we're about to just really and truly dive into Elise Simmons, all right? Okay, y'all just let me, ooh, baby, this might be shade. I don't know, do I need to put the shade down? Because it might be some shade. I'm just saying, all right, y'all hold on. It might be a bumpy ride. So as I'm listening to the album, and I get to the middle of it, what I was really like, kind of like feeling this need to want to criticize, I had no other choice but to start to criticize the album, the production. This album to me <laughs> gives me the feel of a well-produced demo. You know, this album seems like it's a demo, you know, and you... <laughs> I can see why she got her recording contract. The reason why she got a recording contract is that, I mean, she she sounds good. The songs are great. Uh, 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 the production is, is, is decent. You, you get it. You understand its potential. But that's all I'm getting from this album is the potential of all that is involved. And this is when I'm shaking my finger, you know, about this album, because then come to find out that, of course, she's over at Orpheus. You know, she's Orpheus. All right. Capitol Records, Melba Moore, uh, Freddie Jackson, Melissa Morgan, Kashif. All of these people are over here and everybody out there is just they're surrounded by so much talent that I'm saying to myself, how could this album just fall? apart from just production that looks like, you know, these things need to be, I'm not going to even say fine-tuned mm -mm. because there's no rough edges. There's there's no rough edges when I'm looking at, uh, uh, listening to uh, Elise Simmons, listening to pr the production, listening to the way the song is, is structured and all that stuff. Like there's no rough edges with this at all. It's just the idea that you are a part of a record company that has all the bells and whistles. So for me, I'm saying, where are the bells and whistles for her album? You know, like, what were you guys thinking over there? And, you know, I'm shaking my finger because, again, I don't know how involved Melba Moore was with, you know, some of the production over there, you know, at Orpheus Records. But, of course, you know, we know that she is the one who, you know, pretty much from, you know, the backstory is that she's the one who, you know, was interested in working with Freddie Jackson, so on and so forth. So there you have it. You know, we have the Freddie Jackson, you know, and then you have Kashif. And it seemed like to me this producer who's producing this album, what is that guy's name? Oh, I'm sorry, you guys. I, I got to go to my notes. I'm sorry. The producer of the album is a guy by the name of Donald D. Bowden. He's not a slouch either. It's not that. It's just that why didn't you guys call in the big wig, so to speak, and give these 
give Elise Simmons and give this uh, uh, producer, you know, all give him access, give them access to all the bells and whistles. That's it. Like from the from the middle part of the album on down, you you just like, oh my gosh, like okay, did I buy a demo album? You know, that's how I'm thinking about this album. And then it really makes it really bothers me when I get to the song uh, called uh, "Somebody to Love Me." And listen to this song makes me think that that's what it is. You need. I'm not gonna say a better producer. But I would like to think a, a lead producer, maybe the guy who's producing it could have been a co-producer or just bring in another more experienced producer to help. Because it sounds like to me, the song Somebody to Love Me could have definitely been, excuse me, you guys, definitely have been a power, power ballad for her. You know, and it, when you listen to it, it's almost like, she is trying to hold back on uh, the song because it looks like the background singers in the production can't keep up with her. So it's, it, I, I'm getting this feel like she is like kind of holding back. Don't do too much because they, they're not going to be able to keep up. Somebody somewhere is not in sync when it comes to this album for whatever reason. And then again, it just goes downhill from there. And then you get, listen, you guys, then you get to her version of Sweet Thing, Shaka Khan's Sweet Thing. And you see her just really like just soaring through it. I mean, she's giving it all she's got, you know, and you know she has it. And you're looking like, what? What were you guys thinking of? I don't know. I have so many theories about this that I don't even know where to begin. And a couple of theories I have could be, number one, you have Elise Simmons shows up and she shows up with all of this potential. So, you know, she has the goods. And I don't know how I'm going to I'm just going to speculate with the producer. Maybe she knew the producer or maybe they also found a producer who they felt like had the goods as well. And maybe this was their opportunity to shine. You know, all right. You know, we're giving over the reins to you. You know, this is your show. You know, it, it looks like you guys can work kind of well together. So let's let's see what you got. And maybe this is what they delivered, you know, on their own. And. Capital Records or Orpheus Records, Bo Higgins and them didn't give them anything other than a shot and an opportunity to do it. Because as I'm listening to the production of this album, it sounds just like what Kashif would do. You know, Kashif was not a producer who was, uh, you know, all over the place with his production. When I mean by all over the place, like he, you wasn't going to get this big production from him. You know, you were just going to get something just very smooth, simple, you know, like, and, and that's it. You know, he just, the, 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 the bed of the music, you know, it was just that, that if he could just sit there and play the piano and give you all the piano, <laughs> like he was just, he kept it simple and it worked, you know, and that seems like this is what this producer was also doing. You know, and as I said, the producer's not a slouch. He just needs more. He needs more to work with. He needs to include more because simple is definitely not working. And also, too, it doesn't seem like he has a sound, this producer. You know, most producers have a particular sound. And even Kashif has a certain kind of sound, a certain kind of style. That's why I'm saying I'm wondering if that's what it is. Hey, we're giving you a shot and here it is. But shame on them if that's what it was because to look at all of the uh, possibilities, all of the things that they were around and to see that they didn't get, it's, it seemed like there was no assistance. I'm like no assistance with this project at all. You know, it, 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 it doesn't, it, it's almost like a C plus album from production it's, or, or C minus. You know, C plus, C minus. I think I'm giving it more of a C minus uh, album only because of that. You know, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm so disappointed. 
you know, that I, she's not one of those divas who could have at least been up there with, you know, uh, uh, let's just say a Shanice Wilson or a Tracy Spencer. You know, she could have been up there. She could have been one of those divas that we were talking about from our childhood that pretty much stuck around and it didn't happen. So that's my one of my theories. The other theory is this. Oh, Lord. OK. Well, this is 1988, right, when she releases this album. Now, I'm not going to speculate on what's going on between Melba Moore and her husband, Bo Higgins, okay? I'm not going to speculate. But, of course, you know that they're about to be, you know, Splitsville in a couple of years. So, I don't know, if, are they even interested, you know, in, you know, putting their efforts into anything anymore, you know, because that album with Melba Moore, uh, gosh, what was Melba Moore's? Soul, is it Soul? Soul Exposed, that's it. Soul Exposed that had the hit uh, on it, um, Lift Every Voice and Sing, that she had all of the people on it. You know, and I really love that song. You know, her album was just not in it either. You know, when I heard her album, like uh, Soul Exposed, I, I was like, okay, she looked like she done lost focus. And then again, I think after that, you end up, you know, hearing about them being divorced. So maybe it could be one of those things where they just kind of like, oh, okay, we're going to sign an artist. It is what it is. So maybe Elise Simmons came into, you know, the Orpheus production camp. Hush Productions camp, rather, you know, at a time where, you know, it looked like everything was about to go, I ain't going to say downhill, but split spills, so to speak. So that's another one of my uh, theories behind, you know, Elise Simmons and why, you know, we didn't get, you know, what we got from her. But anywho, from a songwriting standpoint, you know, I'm going to really and truly have to look into Destiny's Child because I am finding a lot of R&B divas right now who have worked with Destiny's Child. And Elise Simmons is another R&B diva who has, you know, worked on Destiny's Child album. And then you have, of course, Candy Burris, you know, from Escape. You know, she's done some things with, um, 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 I can't even think of the child name, uh, Destiny's Child. And then we have another diva from Abstract. Um, I can't think of her name right now, but she's from the group Abstract that had the song out called Right in Hype. Oh, God, what is that group's name? I'm sorry, you guys. Abstract. And what is, oh, what is the lady's name? Mary Brown. I think her name is Mary Brown. And she wrote a No, No, No by uh, Destiny's Child. So it looked like Destiny's Child has some girl power going on. So I'm going to have to check that out. I'm just going to kind of look around. You know, I'm not much of a Destiny's Child fan like that. Uh, but I'm definitely going to look at their credits and see, you know, like, who are the other females that they worked with? I started liking uh, Destiny's Child when they released the single uh, Independent Women. When they did that, I was like, uh-oh. I'm liking these girls. Like that's when I was like, oh, it's done. And I just start liking them after that, you know. But anywho, moving right along from that. So that's what it is uh, on that end. But let me just let you guys know exactly who are some of the people that she did work with, uh, Elise Simmons. So, of course, Destiny's Child, she's worked with them. She's worked with uh, the group Next, Shaggy. Uh, Dawn Robinson, Whitney Houston, Aretha Franklin, Christina Million, Latoya London, uh, Case Coco, another R&B diva in a female group, and Deborah Cox. You know, so and of course, it looks like she's done some things with Britney Spears and Music Soul Child. So you know, as I said, she you know has done a couple of things look like in the early two thousands. And I'm not quite sure, you know, what she's doing now. You know, I couldn't even find an updated picture, you know, uh, to post for this uh, video here. But it's, it's, it is what it is. I'm just saying shame on you guys over there for, you know, uh, these this diva and this producer look like they fell through the cracks when it looks as if you guys over there, they were surrounded by so much, you guys, and it looked like it just didn't 
it didn't pay off for him like like that, like the album didn't. Even though the album did do quite well for her, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think the album or the single rather, uh, I Want to Be Your Lover was a top 10 hit. And as usual, it looks like with some of these R&B divas, you know, the first single probably was a top 20, top 10 hit. And then when they released the second single, it looks like the second single is the one that really wasn't in there. It hovered around the top 40 on the R&B charts. And then there you have it. You know, we didn't hear anything else from them again. You know, I'm not quite sure. You know, again, I have some theories that I am developing, you know, putting together. And we'll talk about that, you know, in another video here in the near future. Well, on that note. If you made it this far in the video, then I think it's definitely appropriate to say, hey, hang out with me, you know, hit the subscribe button. I thank you for your support. We're de definitely over here meeting a lot of goals as far as, you know, the analytics and all the algorithm that's going on. You just got to get those subscribers up. It's just what, what it is. So, you know, hey, you guys, you know, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button. You know what I'm saying? You have not because you ask not. But then again, the Lord can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that I could ever hope for or ask or think. You understand what I'm saying? It's the Lord. The Lord. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> on that note, don't forget to put your behind where your heart desires to be. <laughs> and whenever I leave my mother's presence, she always says to me, baby, remember, I love you, but God loves you best. So, hey, love yourself, love others. I'm here to tell you, it's just what it is. Love hides a multitude of faults, baby. And <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing you next video. And until then, you know what I'm going to tell you by now. You guys take care of yourselves. <laughs>